Heavenly Father, we thank you for being in attendance with us throughout this weekend, and as we come to the final presentation, we ask that you would once again be with us through your spirit, your angels. Um, we ask that our minds would hear your voice in these prophetic presentations. We thank you for the easy times that we've had this weekend in terms of uh, what's going on in the world. Um, it was very easy to come together. We know these times are soon to be removed. And we ask that uh, this information would be something that your Holy Spirit would use to not just change our lives, but be provide tools for us to help change other lives. And when we break up afterwards, we ask that you would um, give us Traveling Mercies home and put us in an environment where we can test these things that we've been considering this weekend. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that uh, the information that we've been sharing this weekend is accurate. There, there's almost certainly some parts of it that as a human being I'm putting an incorrect emphasis on or I'm not understanding fully. You know, I'm not saying that my understanding is perfect in these things, but I do believe the message that we're sharing. And as we said at the outset, this is kind of a, a follow-up to the foundation of what we share, which is the 40-hour prophecy school. Um, so this is a little bit more advanced than we would typically share in a setting like this. But if you've heard my prayers, um, I have been asking that the Lord would put conviction upon your hearts to test these things. I really, I really mean that. I mean, I believe this message is strong enough that the way that, that you're going to be convinced that it's correct is when you start testing it on your own uh, personal um, knees and uh, your own personal study. And uh, so those prayers are, are really meant for that. And plus you have that responsibility. Um, there is a presentation that we did several years ago, and the very first presentation, we, instead of having a sermon, we had a friend of mine who has a very nice voice. He goes to church with us in Arkansas. Um, he read an A.T. Jones sermon, and it was a sermon from a series of presentations that A.C. Jones did at a general conference session, and you have to remember that when you think about this sermon. Um, I think it was 1893 five years into the 1888 message, and, and in those gen days, the general conference session was made up of just the, the pastors and leadership of the Adventist church. There wasn't a lot of lay people there at those meetings, if any. So he's speaking to the pastors and the leadership of the Adventist church at this general conference session, of which by far the greatest majority have been opposing everything he's doing uh, publicly and even being more malicious behind his back. And he's looking these men in the eyes. He knows this is the, the case. And he gives a sermon that it's just profound. He, he lays it out from the Bible that uh, it doesn't matter what A.T. Jones says or it doesn't matter what the general conference president says. When someone's standing in front of God's people sharing God's word, the only question is for you and I is does this agree with God's word? And if it agrees with God's word, we don't have the choice to decide whether we accept it or we reject it. If it agrees with God's word, we must accept it. And the, the sermon, it was, it's just a really profound sermon, particularly when you consider the environment. He's looking these men in, in the eye that have been opposing him, and at he's, he's, he, one point he says, uh, Brother so-and-so comes to me and s asks me, uh, what do I think about this passage in Scripture? And he says, it doesn't matter what A.T. Jones thinks about this passage in Scripture. What does the Bible say about this passage in Scripture? And that is really something that we need to bear in mind. If for whatever reason, providential reason, that the Lord brought you to these meetings, we have to believe if we're Christians that the Lord brought us here at this place in this time, whatever providential reasons he led us here, um, we don't have the, the right as a Christian to take any human being's opinion. Our responsibility is to go and test these things that we've been hearing, trusting that the Lord did bring us here, either to convict us that these things are so, 
or convict us that they aren't so, that he can somehow use us to present uh, the, the truth about this fanaticism, if that were the case. I don't believe that, but you, you have responsibility to choose one way or another based upon God's word, whether what you're hearing is correct or incorrect, and act accordingly. And I would pray that you would do so. Um, the vision of the Hittical. In Testimonies to Ministers, page 112, the light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. The visions he saw by the banks of the Uli and the Hittical, the great rivers of Shinar, are now in process of fulfillment, and all the events foretold will soon come to pass. Proverbs 29, 15, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The, the vision for God's people at the end of the world, the, the message, the understanding, the increase of knowledge from Daniel 12 that takes place at the end of the world, I am under conviction personally, is the last six verses of Daniel 11. These v verses portray how the papacy is once again placed upon the throne of the earth and the persecution that follows after she's placed upon the throne of the earth. This passage in Scripture um, can be defended, this understanding from this passage in Scripture can be defended from a variety of ways, but I think this passage in Scripture is so important to the Lord that He has purposely put several avenues of prophetic truth within His Word that clearly support this understanding. One of them we just dealt with, the triple application of prophecy. When you look at these different prophecies that deal with Rome and God's Word, you'll see that they all contribute a piece of information that is in agreement with what we're saying about the last six verses of Daniel 11. Um, so we have the, the right, particularly after what we shared in the first half of this presentation, to assume that a Seventh-day Adventist living at the end of the world, that we're in the time period where the parable of the ten virgins is going to be fulfilled again, where the, the events symbolized by the seven thunders are going to take place again, where Daniel 12 is going to be fulfilled again. We have the right to expect that we're in the time period when that's going to take place. And we have the responsibility to be looking for the light um, that is increased, that prepares us to stand. And we should expect that when this light finally arrives in history, that there is going to be a resistance against this light raised up within Adventism, because this message is for Adventism. I think we may have said this once, or maybe it was just an in-between meeting. Um, I believe, and I think you can show very clearly, that the last six verses of Daniel 11 is the message for Adventism. This is the message that has been designed by God to awaken His people at the end of the world. Uh, it awakens them by, in advance, telling them that the Sunday Law is about to take place, um, which c drives them to the foot of the cross that they might secure the experience that they need to receive the seal of God at the Sunday Law. That's the message for Adventism, the last six verses of Daniel 11. These events that lead to the Sunday Law began in 1989, verse 40 of Daniel 11, and the Sunday Law is verse 41. If this is true, then if it's correctly understood by a Seventh-day Adventist, and he cooperates with the Holy Spirit, then he strives to achieve that experience that qualifies for the seal of God when verse 41 arrives in history. But this is not the message for people outside of Adventism. The message uh, for the wor world is to see men and women that perfectly reflect the character of Christ. Two different messages Ours are these verses. And Satan knows these things better than we know these things. So when the time period at the end of the world comes, when there's going to be an increase of knowledge based upon the history of the great controversy, we know full well that Satan's going to be there battling this message um, tooth and nail. And not only that, if we're going to be reasonable about it, we're going to see that Satan has put roadblocks um, in the history of Adventism from way back when in an attempt to prevent this message. He was understanding these things better than we for many, many years. I think one of these roadblocks, of course, is the daily. The, the, the beginning of the 20th century, um, 1900, 1901 um, is the time period where the Seventh-day Adventist was, church was beginning to reap the results of rejecting 
the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the 1888 message. This is quite plainly said. This is the beginning of the loud cry message. This message that Jones and Wagner were, were bringing. And Jones and Wagner, in, in Advent history, we usually think of them as the, the men that were clearly identifying uh, the truth about justification and sanctification, but that's a very limited view of them. A.T. Jones is the man in American history that prevented the passage of the Blair Bill in 1888. He was actively involved with defending religious liberty. He wasn't just out preaching justification and sanctification. In that time period in Adventism, uh, you know, in Adventism today, uh, we're all in our own spheres of Adventism, uh, you know, so I can't say this in a general way. Uh, but for me, you know, in, in the sphere, the pond I swim in in Adventism, there are certain men that if you want the subject of country living to be presented at your church on Sabbath, you invite these men. If you want righteousness by faith to be presented, you invite these men. There are certain people that we know. And if you go back into the history of 1888 and, and beyond, in the, the pond of Adventism at that time, if you wanted someone to come to your church and present prophecy, who is it going to be? Who is going to be one of the main people to invite? A.T. Jones. A.T. Jones was one of the big names in Adventism for, for nailing down Bible prophecy. He wasn't just sitting there. It wasn't only presenting justification and sanctification. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to lift A.T. Jones up. I know what happened to A.T. Jones. I'm just su suggesting that at that time period, the Lord was prepared to finish the work, pour out his Holy Spirit, and the men that were identified by inspiration as leading out in that work at that time, they weren't simply presenting the message of righteousness by faith. They were participating in, in being champions for defending religious liberty, which is directly connected to the issue of the Sunday Law, and they were studying prophecy and teaching prophecy. That time period that followed the rejection of that work brought in the Alpha of Apostasy. And I understand that in Adventism, and I understand there may be some newer in Adventism here than others, but when the doctrine of pantheism was uh, brought into Adventism by Kellogg in that time period after 1888, some of us are led to believe that uh, when Sister White called that the Alpha of Apostasy, that that was it. That it was, it was simply dealing with Kellogg's promotion of the, the teachings of pantheism. I don't believe that. I believe that the Alpha of Apostasy encompassed all the things that were going wrong during that time period. There was more things going wrong during that time period than simply Kellogg's fascination with pantheism. And for me, I believe that in 1901, one component of the Alpha of Apostasy was the introduction of the false view of the daily. It was, it was brought into Adventism by a man named Conradi um, from Europe, uh, one of the most famous apostates in the history of Adventism, and uh, virtually single-handed has destroyed any respect for the spirit of prophecy in Europe. He rejected the sanctuary message. He rejected the writings of Ellen White and in the 1901 time period, he brought back in the old Protestant view of the daily that it represented Christ's work in the sanctuary into Adventism by introducing Wagner of the Jones and Wagner frame, fame to this um, information. And Wagner shared it with two men named Daniels and Prescott who began to be the champions of promoting the view that the daily, that the pioneers understood was incorrect and that this new view that the daily represented Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary was correct. It's called New View in Advent history. When Sister White talks about it, or the historians talk about it, they call it the New View, but it was really the Old View. It was the old Protestant view that existed before William Miller. William Miller, when he came to understand the daily as paganism, and he is the one that came to that understanding, and the other Millerite preachers accepted it after they tested it out, that was the New View. But when 1901 comes around, and the, the Old View is brought back in, in terms of Advent history, it's called the New View, and... I believe it was a component of the Alpha of Apostasy. And at its simple level, the simplest level, the old view is that it was paganism, that the daily represented a satanic power, and the new view, the Conradi view, the view that we possess today, is that it's Christ's work in the sanctuary. It's a godly power. So when you look at the two views, the pioneer view and the view we hold today, 
The daily represents either a satanic power or a godly power. And that isn't a, a close comparison. I mean, that's totally the opposite. It's not a slight difference in understanding. It's not, they're not closely related. It's totally the opposite. To identify this symbol as a power of Satan or to identify this symbol as a power of God, how much, how, is there a greater contradiction that you can develop? I don't think so. So, if you look at Isaiah 28 and 29, you'll find that these two passages are dealing with the leadership of God's people at the end of the world. And on page 114, we have um, part of Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29 begins with verse 1 that says, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Add, year, add ye year to year, let them kill sacrifices. Uh, Ariel is a word for Jerusalem. You can take any Bible concordance, and they're going to tell you that a Ariel is a word for Jerusalem. Uh, you know, what, what do we call Los Angeles? L.A. You ask an American, what's L.A.? They're going to tell you Los Angeles. Ar Ariel means Jerusalem. This is a passage here that's dealing with Jerusalem. In Testimonies, Volume 5, Sister White says Jerusalem at the end of the world is what? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. So if you take up this passage, once we know that this is a, um, a passage dealing with Jerusalem, if you drop down to verse 9, it starts out and it says, Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Isaiah is describing a condition here within the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world. For somehow, some way, for some reason, the Lord has poured uh, the spirit of deep sleep upon these men in Jerusalem, and they are spiritually drunken. Then it goes on and says, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Now, brothers and sisters of Seventh-day Adventists, what book is sealed? The book of Daniel is the book that is sealed, right? When Isaiah is talking about the book sealed. Now, my brothers and sisters, we started on what some of the basic premises of Bible prophecy. Sister White says, Each of the ancient prophets spoke more for our day than the days in which they live, so that their prophesy is in force for those of us that live at the end of the world. Then she quotes 1 Corinthians 10, 11. So was Isaiah speaking about the end of the world? Yes. And he's speaking about God's church, Jerusalem, at the end of the world. So he's speaking about Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh Adventism at the end of the world, and in Seventh-day Adventism at the end of the world, what is the book that is sealed? It's the book of Daniel. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Now what, what's being described here? A learned man has delivered a book that is sealed and asks, Can you tell me what this says? He says, I can't do it. It's sealed. It goes on. It says, And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. So I want you to see if this is Jerusalem, if this is the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world, and Isaiah is accurate, that there are two groups of people here in this passage that can't understand the book that is sealed, whatever that book is. There's a group of people in Adventism that are categorized as learned. You tell me what that means. I mean, I know, I know what I think it means, but when I've expressed that, some people have, have thought that I was being highly critical. Who are the learned in Adventism, theologians, theologians educators, uh, the leadership. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm real, I know I, there's no way you can get around saying something like this without people uh, I, identifying that you're being critical, and I can understand their logic. You can take what I'm saying, and, and the words that I'm saying can be uh, demonstrated as if I'm being critical, but I'm really not. I'm being accurate. My understanding of, of what's about to take place in Adventism is that uh, there's very few of us that are preparing for the seal of God. Very few. 
whether we're, lear- whether we're leadership or not leadership, our condition is that we're sick head to toe. That's what Isaiah says. We're sick from the head to the toe. But in this passage of Isaiah, this isn't dealing with any um, specific, it's not giving me an excuse to criticize, all right? It's not doing that. It's trying to give us some light about the end of the world. That, that's how I'm relating to this. And in order to understand this light correctly, I need to try to apply the symbols correctly. So it seems to me pretty simple lo- logic that the learned is represented uh, representing the, the people in Adventism that have some kind of rank or position that's based upon education, whatever that may be. But there's another group here of identifying those in Adventism that don't have that rank or position based upon um, credentials and education. So it's really identifying the whole spectrum of Adventism, is it not? And you notice that, that there's two excuses given. The learned men say, I can't read this book that's sealed. Why? Because it's sealed. But those that aren't learned, those that aren't educated in Adventism, they can't read this book that is sealed. Why? Because they're only going to understand this book if someone that is learned teaches it to them. They refuse to study it on their own because they know full well they couldn't understand it right. They're not learned. Two excuses here. And this is at the end of the world in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Continuing on, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do they do honor me, with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us, who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. Now, brothers and sisters, this is the part, this is, that statement is the reason that I'm convicted to add this to the presentation. As Isaiah's describing a condition in the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world where God's people, the learned and the unlearned, are not capable of understanding the books of Daniel and Revelation, the book that is sealed, they're the same book. Isaiah tells us why. And the reason why is they've turned something upside down. Brothers and sisters. No. I'm not saying it is. The learned and the unlearned. It's a put down on everyone in Adventism. No matter which excuse we use for not understanding the book of Daniel. But the Lord here through Isaiah is telling us why we can't understand it. It's because we've turned something upside down, brothers and sisters. And I submit to you that what we turned upside down was the daily. It was the daily. The daily, the pioneers under, understood to be a satanic power, paganism. And Sister White says in early writings, page 74, the pioneers are correct. She doesn't use those words, but that's just exactly what they said, she said. But at the end of the world, We're saying the daily in the book of Daniel is not a satanic power. It's a godly power. We've turned it completely upside down. That's the alpha of prophetic error. Came in during the time period of the alpha apostasy from 1900 to 1915 when all these things were getting turned upside down. But Jesus... He's the first and the last. He portrays the end with the beginning. And I submit to you that the alpha of prophetic error is pointing forward to the omega of prophetic error. There's an omega of prophetic error at the end of the world. It's pretty much the same thing, only it's different. You know what the the omega of prophetic error is at the end of the world? It's once again taking a prophetic symbol 
that is a satanic power and saying that it's a godly power. Same thing. Same thing as the alpha with the daily. Only different. Brothers and sisters, at the end of the world, the message of the hour is the last six verses of Daniel 11 and the argument on the last six verses of Daniel 11 in Adventism from the top to the bottom is what is the glorious land? Is it the United States at the time period that it's forcing the world to accept the Sunday law, a satanic power, or is it the Seventh-day Adventist church, a godly power? Which is it? Which is it? I don't think it's an accident, brothers and sisters, that it's basically the same error as the daily. In the Alpha time period, here in the Omega time period, at the end of the world, we have the same prophetic argument. Is it a satanic power or is it a godly power? I don't think it's an accident either that the pioneers who were correct said the daily was paganism, pagan Rome. I don't think it's an accident that pagan Rome is a type of the United States. Because the glorious land is the United States. It's a satanic power. It's not the Seventh-day Adventist church, a godly power. And when we turn these things upside down, we destroy our ability to understand what's going on in the world today. We, we really do. Now, I know, I know people that understand the daily correctly, but they argue about the correct way to understand the glorious land. So there's a lot of variations in how you relate to these things. But basically, in terms of Isaiah 29, I think Isaiah is being very specifically, very, very specific that there is a way to turn something upside down that closes your ability, closes your eyes, brings sleep upon you, drunkenness on you, where you cannot understand the books that are the book that is sealed, Daniel and Revelation. You'll see this quote um, from early writings 74. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text. And the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. How simple is that? When it comes to the daily, the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. That passage in early writings, this paragraph in early writings, has been argued about and written about in Advent history since 1901. People say this is where Wagner lost his confidence in Ellen White. Because Wagner accepted the idea that the daily was Christ's work in the sanctuary, and he makes a statement that Sister White clearly is endorsing the position that the daily represents paganism, and therefore, she, she doesn't say must be a false prophet. But he couldn't, he couldn't comprehend with the contradiction. He knew the daily was Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, but he knew full well that Sister White is endorsing the idea that the daily represents paganism. And that's, that's where he stumbled, on the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy. And there's been much history connected with this passage in early writing 74. So, hey, I'll, I'll leave this one in your hand. How do you relate to that? Does, is Sister White endorsing any? The, the pioneer position on the daily here, or is she not? She is. She is. The last quarter of 2004. In the last quarter of 2004, in the Sabbath school lessons, um, Gerhard Fandel wrote that quarter of Sabbath school study, taught black and white that the, the daily uh, in the book of Daniel is... Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary. So, uh, I, they haven't, uh, I don't think Adventism has taken an official position, you know, that this is how we understand it officially. But brothers and sisters, we're at the end of the world, and the predominant opinion, without a doubt, in Adventism is that paganism was a mistake and that it represents a godly power, not a satanic power. I think we've turned things upside down. Um, Next page, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. We've went through this before. We've went through this before in this presentation. Let no man deceive you. Paul puts that in there not because he just felt like adding some words into this passage. Holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Paul puts this statement in to say, as you're considering the following words, 
pay attention because we're talking about a subject where deception takes place. Is that how you understand it? That's a warning, okay? What you're going to read here, this is something where you need to pay attention about being deceived or not. Let no man deceive you. And then what does he tell? This is the passage, brothers and sisters. This is the passage where William Miller came to understand that the daily was paganism. These verses here. So right in the very passage of scripture where, where William Miller concluded that the daily was paganism, we find the warning about Paul, don't be deceived. And at the end of, of this discussion, Paul says there's going to be a group of people that because they do not have the love of the truth, are going to receive strong delusion. You have to, if you're going to think about this deeply and seriously, I believe you have to ask yourself then, what is this subject that Paul is speaking about that leads to the position that if you don't have a love of the truth in connection with this subject, you're going to receive strong delusion. You especially need to understand this is a Seventh-day Adventist because Sister White is clear that this strong delusion that's being discussed here, this is the darkness that Adventism goes into at the end of the world that parallels the darkness that the foolish virgins on October 22nd, 1844 went into. And what happened to those foolish virgins? They continued to pray to the holy place and Satan answered their prayers. This strong delusion is the counterpart to the darkness that took place on the foolish virgins on October 22nd, 1844. It's easy to show that, but in any case, with this kind of serious implications, you have to ask yourself, what is Paul discussing here that he's saying don't be deceived about, and on this subject, if you don't love the truth, you go into strong delusion, and brothers and sisters, any good Bible commentary Adventists or non-Adventists will tell you that the subject of these verses is the subject of pagan Rome restraining the papacy from taking control of the world. Paganism, papalism. There's something about the prophetic truth about the relationship between paganism and papalism that if we don't have it straight, we end up in total darkness at the end of the world. And I'd submit to you, 1 Corinthians 14, 32. The spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. They're all speaking about the end of the world, and they're all agreeing with one another. So when Isaiah is saying at the end of the world, we can't understand the book that's sealed because we've turned something upside down, and Paul's saying here, if you don't have the love of this particular truth, you go into strong delusion. I'd submit to you that the truth that prepares the way for people to receive strong delusion if they don't love it is the correct understanding of the daily in the book of Daniel. And if it isn't, what is it? What isn't? Because it's clearly a, a serious, serious passage. Notice the next quote, Selected Messages, book 3, page 154. First to be left. I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the world, and those who have great light and opportunities, those who have had great light and opportunities, and in the writing, writings of Ellen White, in her terminology, who is it? Who's the group that's had great light and opportunity? Seventh-day Adventist Church. So here's who she's speaking about. Seventh-day Adventist. Those who have had great light and opportunities and have not improved them will be the first to be left. Brothers and sisters, at the Sunday Law, the door closes on the virgins of Adventism. And those that have had great light and opportunities but have not improved them, they go into perfect darkness. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is the first corporate body of people at the end of the world that become totally void of the Holy Spirit. That's not counting the fact that there is a group of Seventh-day Adventists at that same time period that have been separated from that group through the process of the Sunday Law and received the seal of God. And that is the Seventh-day Adventists, by the way, at that time. But what I want you to see is in terms of identifying a corporate body of people at the end of the world that are the first to be totally void of the Holy Spirit, it's those Seventh-day Adventists that haven't improved the light that they've been given. And you know what this is? This is a parallel passage to receiving strong delusion because they did not love a certain truth. Prophets, spirit of the prophets, are subject unto the prophets. Ellen White's just giving the same commentary as Paul here, only taking it from a different perspective. 
Next quote, Great Controversy 390. Revelation 18 points to a time when as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. When those that believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2.12, shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie, then the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it, and the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call, come out of her, my people. Brothers and sisters, who is it that receives the strong delusion of 2 Thessalonians? This is Seventh-day Adventists. The seventh day Adventist, because it's after this strong delusion that God's other children in Babylon come and stand with God's people. Daniel 12, next page. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, set up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased at the end of the world when the parable of the ten virgins is fulfilled again to the very letter and Daniel 12 is fulfilled again to the very letter and the seven thunders is repeated to the very thunder. There will be an increase of knowledge. Why does this increase of knowledge come about? Because the lion of the tribe of Judah is going to unseal the prophecy that's been sealed up. We went through that this weekend. And this knowledge, this increase of knowledge, is what prepares God's people to stand in these latter days, just like the increase of knowledge prepared the Millerites to accomplish their work at the beginning of Adventism. Then I looked, then I, Daniel, looked and beheld there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up the, his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, ever, ever, and <coughs> forever, that it shall be for a time, a time, time times and a half, when he ha shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understand, stood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And I heard, but I understood not. And I heard, but I understood not. This is Daniel 12. Drop down to the, to the, the last paragraph on this page. This is Daniel 10.1. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, and the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. Daniel 10.1 is the same vision as Daniel 12. They're the same vision. And the very first thing that we're told in Daniel's last vision in verse 1 is that he has understanding of the thing and he understands the vision. Is that how you understood it? The first thing we're told in Daniel's last vision is that Daniel understands it. But here in Daniel 12, Daniel says, I heard, but I understood not. Is that a contradiction? It's the very same vision. The first thing we're told is that Daniel understood, and then here in chapter 12, he don't understand what's going on here. Daniel's, Daniel's symbolizing God's people at the end of the world. Who's he symbolizing here? The Millerite movement. The Millerite movement. They didn't understand the time prophecies of Daniel. Wasn't that the time prophecy of Daniel? Time, times, and a half? They didn't understand the 1260, but li the Lion of the tribe of Judah unsealed the time prophecies in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Daniel symbolizing the Millerite movement that do not understand the time prophecies. They wish to understand the time prophecies. And he's portraying the Millerites in a time period where the discussion is, is that there's going to be an increase of knowledge when these books are unsealed. And these books are unsealed at the beginning of the Millerite time period. So Daniel is illustrating the Millerite time period, but he's also illustrating God's people at the end of the world. Why do I say that? Because of Daniel 10.1. 
But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and he had understanding of the vision. This vision, this isn't the complete vision. This is the snapshot vision. This is the vision that speaks of Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary. Daniel in chapter 10 is symbolizing both the beginning and the ending of God's people. Daniel's representing God's people at the end of the world that we know is the 144,000 that have had a personal confrontation with Jesus Christ as, as represented by Daniel in Daniel 10 when he's humbled in the dust by the vision of Jesus Christ in the most holy place. You know, the brother, I don't remember his name, the brother that was here earlier, the elderly man, his wife was elderly, so they had to go home. He pointed something out after the one presentation where I mentioned this earlier, which I agree with. He was just adding to what I said. When, when Daniel seen the, the snapshot vision in Daniel 8, which was the vision of Christ taking up the work of the investigative judgment as the high priest, it totally amazed Daniel. Read the passage in connection with the snapshot vision. When Daniel seen Christ as the, the high priest, he could not understand it. It overwhelmed him. And what the, the brother, the elderly brother, brother added to it afterwards is he says, you know, Daniel understood the priesthood. The priesthood, who is, who is going to be the priest? What family? The Levites. And not only did he see Christ taking up the work of the, the high priest, he recognized that it wasn't a Levite. This really amazed him too. This this was the line of the tribe of Judah. He didn't have the, the credentials to be the high priest. Daniel was just overwhelmed with this vision. But Daniel's representing the people that are confronted with this vision and come to understand it. They're humbled in the dust when they enter in by faith to the investigative judgment and cooperate with Christ in the work of putting away sin, both in the heavenly sanctuary by Christ in our individual life by ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's who he's representing. We read those quotes from Sister White and there are many other. Daniel represents those that are sanctified at the end of the world. Remember those quotes? We pointed them out specifically. He's representing you and I at the end of the world. We have understanding of that vision, of that experience in the most holy place, but we also have understanding of the book of Daniel and Revelation, the prophetic vision of the time of the end. In Daniel 10.1, this isn't the Millerites because they didn't understand the investigative judgment. It hadn't arrived yet. Daniel 12, this is the Millerites. They're coming to understand the time prophecies from Daniel 12. But brothers and sisters, at the end of the world, time is no longer. Time is no longer. So I'd submit to you this, and, and you may have not thought this one through. In Daniel 12, when Daniel is symbolizing God's people at the end of the world that did not understand the time prophecies, he was representing the Millerite movement. They did not understand the time prophecies, but there was going to be an increase of knowledge. They were to understand them, but he is also there representing you and I at the end of the world. Not simply because we've forgotten what the time prophecies were, but the time prophecies in Daniel 12, the 1260 that's mentioned in Daniel 12, what's associated with the 1260 in Daniel 12? It's the time period where the power of the holy, holy people is scattered. And brothers and sisters, you and I need to understand that. That truth in Bible prophecy, the scattering and the gathering, is a truth that God's people need to understand at the end of the world, and it has, it has a relationship, but we don't need to understand the time element of it. We need to understand what it means prophetically that God scattered his people for 2,520 years. Because in 1798, when the scattering was over, the call to the marriage was given. We need to understand these things. That's why in Daniel 12, you have the 1260 associated with the scattering of the power of the holy people. And as soon as Daniel illustrates the Millerites not understanding these things, then we have the time prophecy of the 1290 and the 1335, which brings us to the blessing of 1843, which was the year of the announcement of the wedding. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand what's going on 
in the most holy place based upon Bible prophecy. Sister White says the reasons why we are God's denominated people is to be repeated and repeated. Brothers and sisters, we are modern Israel. We are those that reflect not only the character of Christ, but have an understanding of his holy word in such an intelligent way that we can win sons and daughters to God that at this time do not understand the issues. There has never been a higher calling than to be among the 144,000. And these time prophecies in Daniel 12 have a direct connection to the development of God's remnant church at the end of time. And the 144,000 need to understand these things. And these things have been removed from our understanding. They've been sealed up through customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. And one of the most dastardly of those traditions has to do with defining the role of Rome in Bible prophecy because it is Rome that establishes the vision. Any way you address end time Bible prophecy, if you're going to do it correctly, you're going to see that the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, calls us to understand Rome as a point of reference to bringing together the correct understanding of end time events. And it has been obscured and removed by a doctrine that was brought into Adventism by the Prince of Darkness at the beginning of the 20th century. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 117, we're on. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 105 to 106. We've read this a couple times. First paragraph closes with, by the increase of knowledge of people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. And then the bottom paragraph, it says, in the first angel's message, men are called upon to worship God, our creator, made the world and all things that are therein. They've paid homage to an institution of the papacy, making no effect the law of Jehovah. But there is to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. Brothers and sisters, I, we are without excuse. When we finally get to the threshold of understanding to realize that there will be an increase of knowledge that takes place, that prepares the 144,000 to stand. When we get to that point in our understanding um, that the 144,000 are walking through the same events as the Millerite time period, we're without excuse because inspiration has told us that this incre increase of knowledge has to do with the papacy and the Sunday law. That's the message of the hour. And you just can't get away from the fact that the last six verses of Daniel 11 is dealing with the papacy and the Sunday law. This is the message of the hour. This increase of knowledge, Hosea 4, 6, is also speaking to the end of the world as all the other prophets do. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you bring Isaiah 29 into this, They can't read the book that is sealed because something's been turned upside down. If you bring Hosea into this, they don't have the knowledge they need because something's been turned upside down. And the increase of knowledge that turns things right side up has to do with the prophetic foundations of Adventism. I was shown that those that gave the judgment our cry had the correct view of the daily. It's not an accident that in early writings 74, the, cha the chapter begins there. What's the title of that chapter? The Gathering. The Gathering. The first paragraph's dealing with the scattering of the power of the holy people of Daniel 12. 1260 years, the power of the holy people is going to be scattered. The next paragraph is, is dealing with confirming the daily. The two time prophecies in Daniel 12 have to do with the scattering of God's people, the 1260. And Daniel heard, but he didn't understand. And as soon as he has that interaction with the angel, 
It says, and from the time the daily is taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up will be 1290 years. These two time prophecies in Daniel 12 are what Sister White is speaking about in the chapter titled The Gathering in opposition to the scattering of the 2520 in early writing 74. And it's there where she gives the simplest and strongest statement on the daily. I want to thank you all for being here. Well, this, this isn't a typical meeting. Um, our purpose is here was to put this information on DVD so we can uh, share it far and wide. And um, Glenn and I, the, for those of you that on DVD can't see Glenn, he's the one running the camera. Uh, the Lord brought Glenn and I together. How many years have we known each other now? 20 some years ago. And uh, he was a brand new Adventist. I was a, a fairly new Adventist. And uh, he came in the church, and I, th I, I thought, well, the best thing that can happen for him is he can start going out and giving Bible studies for me. Well, not for me, with me. And he and I started going out and giving Bible studies for a long time there. And uh, there was some shaking going on back then. We've been uh, in this work for a long time, and I tend to have the desire when I want to record something to just stay at home and record it. And he says, no. He always says, no, no. You, you need a live audience. It works better when you're interacting with people. So we, we thank you for, for uh, being here because it does work better with a live audience. When you can interact, um, the dynamics are better. It's better for, for your recording. But I know it's been a, a long weekend. And uh, for me, I want to emphasize the, the truth, one of the truths of prophecy that I don't think we've looked at close enough, that Jesus is the first and the last. He portrays the end of everything with the beginning of something. He, history and prophecy repeat. We've been told over and over. And when it comes to us as God people at the end of the world, I am convinced, I am certain, that we are now in the time period when the Millerite time period is being fulfilled again to the very letter of the parable of the ten virgins and seven thunders. This is something that needs to be understood by Adventism. This is what is unsealed by the line of the tribe of Judah when he unseals Revelation 10, verse 4. But at the same time, the message, the increase of knowledge that empowers uh, the 144,000, paralleling the empowerment of the Millerite movement, we needed to deal with that. Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And that passage is talking about Rome. And as Christ always does, he illustrates modern Rome from ancient Rome. And there has been a move by Satan through the history of Adventism to throw roadblocks in the way so we cannot understand the importance of understanding the end by looking at the beginning or the importance that Rome has in end time Bible prophecy. That was the purpose of these meetings. I don't know that we succeeded in conveying all that all that way, but this last presentation, you may wonder why, why do you have to spend so much time hammering on the daily. Brothers and sisters, I truly believe probation is about to close. I truly believe the misunderstanding of the daily is going to lead many Seventh-day Adventists into the place where they receive strong delusion. So I was under conviction that along with these other truths that it's time to be very specific about the daily. In the past, generally, I've tried to give the, the defense of the pioneer position of the daily in a clear fashion, how I've understood it. But I think it needs, to be, it needs to be taken to the level now to say, hey, brothers and sisters in Adventism, it's not only that what we're teaching about it is incorrect, but we must be correct on this subject or we're going to be lost. That's how my conviction Perhaps I'm wrong. But because of that conviction, and because of my conviction, we are right at the end of the world, I had to put this last presentation in there. So thank you for participating. Um, we'll close with prayer, and then I know that some have some questions. Shall we bow together? <coughs> Uh, 
Heavenly Father, we thank you. We appreciate the time that you provided for all of us this weekend. I thank you for having brothers and sisters that uh, would respond to the call to participate in a work like this. I personally consider this a work. Um, I ask that you would bless these meetings, not just for us, but that if these things that we're sharing are true and correct, that you would bless the, the after results of these um, production on DVD, audio tape that we're doing with these. We wish to be among that group that goes through these, this purification process of Daniel 12 that ultimately uh, ends up in the earth made new. Whether we live to see you come or we get laid to rest, Lord, we, we seek to live with you for eternity. We uh, surrender ourselves into your hands that whatever it takes to make this happen, uh, that you have the freedom to do so. As we get ready to part, we ask for traveling mercies, and I once again ask that you would put it upon the hearts and minds of my brothers and sisters here to fulfill their Christian responsibility to test these things by your word, by the spirit of prophecy, through prayer. Give them discernment. And Lord, there's, there's so many people in Adventism that uh, seem to be unwilling to hear or consider these things, we ask that you also give us wisdom on how to speak a word in due season and break through um, these walls that have been put up. Help us to be among those that help remove the seal of, a, of false understanding that's been placed upon many of our minds and uh, let the light shine within your church so this loud cry message can go th forward in a mighty way and we can go home with you, we pray in Jesus' name.